All right, in Spirit and Truth, the Fundamentals of Biblical Worship, this is the third of a four part uh, series, the result of biblical worship, which is transcendence, transcendence. In Western culture, we like to measure things in order to give them value. The tallest, the strongest, the biggest, the fastest, the first, the most, the newest. In the Guinness World Book of Records, there's a man who holds the record for having the most records. Imagine. This is why we're so interested in the Olympic Games. I mean, the, the ultimate measurement of human achievement in sports. It reflects the spirit of our times where one's value is ultimately based on one's achievements. i show you a little uh, film clip here, if you remember. Good example of this happened at the 2008 Olympics. And I think that many of us uh, remember and celebrate Michael Phelps, he's on the left there, winning a gold medal, listen to this, he beat the swimmer on the right by one one hundredth of a second. One one hundredth of a second. But have you ever thought for whoever came in second or third, there'll be no celebration for that guy, no fame, no fortune. Anybody here even know the name of the person who came in second by one one hundredth of a second? Yeah, his name Milorad, Milorad Kavik, by the way, from Serbia, he was second. But such are the rules for a system that rewards only achievement. You win by one one hundredth of a second, you're famous all over the world. You come in second by just one one hundredth of a second, nobody knows your name. Nobody knows who you are. Now I say all of this because in the church we are often influenced by the things in the world and it's not a new phenomenon. The Apostle Paul urged the church not to be molded or conformed to this world and he talks about that in Romans chapter 12 verse two. So we know, you know by the fact that he's actually mentioning it way back then that this problem was uh, taking place even in the first century. You see, what happens is that we are influenced by the world to judge our worship in the same way that we judge things that are strictly in the world and of the world. And we forget that worship, although done in this world, is not something of this world. It is an otherworldly thing we do when we worship, even if we do it here on earth. And so the result or the goal of worship is not that we finish on time, or that we do it right, or that we do it very well, or that there be lots of people in attendance, things that you can count, things you can measure, or in our personal worship, or in our personal devotion, the goal is not that we be you know, regular. What's the goal of your personal worship? Well, that I do it every day. Really, that's your goal? that you do it every day? Or that we finish the reading the entire Bible in one year or less? That's your goal in Bible reading? That you read the Bible in one year? Oh, and you're sick one week, so then you're behind 42 chapters and you sit down one night and say, I'm going to knock out these 42 chapters so I can get back on track, so I can finish reading the Bible in one year. Really? Or that we please God? or we please my wife, or we please, you know, we be a good example. This is the objective of worship that we have at times. I mean, all these things have a place and a part in worship, but they're not the ultimate goal. They're not what we're striving for as we come before the Lord in humility to commune with our God. No, the goal of our devotion the final result of our worship in spirit and in truth is transcendence. That's the goal. My goal in personal worship is transcendence. Our goal in public worship is transcendence. 
So before we explore this idea, let's first get a handle on the meaning of this particular word. To transcend means to go beyond the limit, to surpass what is normal. For example, in the world of sport, Muhammad Ali, the boxer, transcended boxing and became more than simply a boxer or an athlete, he became a social and religious and political icon, right? Yes, he could box, yes, he was the champion, but there have been many champion boxers, but not all of them had the impact that Muhammad Ali had. He transcended boxing, went beyond boxing. Transcendence is an essential quality of God's being and character. He is beyond the material and the natural. He is, as we say, supernatural, transcendent. And so when I say that the result of worship is transcendence, I mean that our goal is to get beyond the time we use to worship, to get beyond the simple acts of worship. You know, some people see the various acts of worship. You know what I mean by acts of worship? Uh, praise, prayer, preaching, Lord's Supper, uh, giving, fellowship. Some people see these acts as the goal of worship, a goal in themselves. For example, I worship in spirit and truth because I did these acts. Or because I did them often or because I did them well, or because I did them sincerely or accurately, or because I did them among 10,000 people. Really? Our worship is better because we did it when we're with 10,000 other people? But God has given us these things, the prayer, the praise, the giving. The, God has given us these things so we can communicate with Him and in so doing, transcend these things to a point that we can actually experience Him. Not experience the prayer, experience Him. Not experience the singing, experience Him in the singing. Transcendence in worship is the experiencing of God in our own spirit. Am I describing something which is biblical here? Am I describing something that is even possible? Well, in the Bible, those who served God, sought Him out in prayer and worshiped Him in spirit and truth, they had a transcendent experience of Him. For example, Isaiah the prophet began his book by saying the visions of Isaiah, which he saw, Isaiah chapter one, verse one. This is the transcendence of the prophet, not just a teacher of the law or a counselor to kings, but one who transcended these things to experience God through visions. Now I'm not proposing we have the same today. I'm merely showing an example of transcendence as experienced by one of God's special servants. David, Another example, in bringing the ark from Obed-Edom to Jerusalem, worshiped the Lord with praise, with sacrifices of animals. But in 2 Samuel 6.6, 6, it also says that David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. Upon seeing this, his wife, Michal, called him a fool and she chastised him. And David rebuked her because she couldn't see that he was celebrating before the Lord. He experienced a transcendent joy at the occasion that expressed itself in dance. Again, I'm not saying let's introduce dancing to our worship so that we can attain a transcendent experience. I'm not saying that. I am saying if we experience transcendence in worship, we might want to burst out in some form of expression, maybe dancing even. This morning in my class in Acts, when Peter heals the lame man who was by the gate, 
And he tells them, you know, neither silver or gold have I, but what I do have, you know, get up and walk in the name of Jesus. What does it say? In the book of Acts it says he leapt up. He leapt up for joy. He jumped for joy. That was a transcendent experience. We read the Bible and not only marvel at, but are hungry for the transcendent experiences that we see in the dreams of the prophets and the vision and inspiration of the New Testament writers and the encounters with the Lord that Paul describes, even the powerful manifestations in the early church of mighty works and dynamic growth, even the ground shaking after the saints prayed in thanksgiving for the release of Peter and John from prison in Acts chapter four. They had transcendent experiences in their worship and in their service to God. And I believe this is what we're missing. What we want for our worship in order for it to be satisfying and motivating for us. After all, if we meet to communicate with God Himself, Shouldn't this experience be as or more dynamic than watching a movie or going to a concert or seeing a football game? And yet for many, for most, it isn't. Many are asked to use words to describe their worship experience and often what do we hear? Ah, it's boring, it's long. It's a duty I'm happy to fulfill to please the Lord. It's uh, pleasing to God. Well, it's the right thing to do. I want to fulfill God's will. But we rarely hear the word transcending, joyous, life-changing, bursting with happiness, jumping for joy. I mean, <laughs> what church do you go to in order to feel all of that joy and transcendence and bursting with happiness and leaping with joy. What church do you go to? Because I want to go to that church. I want to be there. I want to have that experience. Now I've got to make a couple of disclaimers here so that you'll not misunderstand. Experiencing transcendence is not the goal of every worship service or every personal devotion or prayer that we have. You see, you don't make transcendence happen, it happens to you. Not because it can't happen. I mean, with God, all things are possible. No, it doesn't happen because we couldn't take it in our present sinful flesh if we were always experiencing transcendence with God. We, we couldn't manage it. Transcendence comes in small doses, enough for us to get a taste of the heaven that awaits us, but not so much that we are rendered useless here on earth. And that taste, that experience of God is reserved for those who worship Him, how? In spirit and in truth. Okay, so now comes the hard question. What about today? What is the nature of that transcendent experience? You know, I've talked about David and Isaiah and these people and they had transcendent experience. What about us? If it's not a direct revelation through a dream or an inner voice, if it's not the empowerment to do miracles or prophecy about the future, what is it exactly? What are you talking about? How can I relate to it today, in, in my day, in my era? Obviously, I don't know all the ways that God permits us to experience and to know Him, thus bringing us beyond the limits of human knowledge and into transcendence. But here are a few of the ways that we experience God and this particular event in our lives today. First of all, we have that here I am Lord experience. That happens to us today. That's a transcendent experience. You know, some refer to it as a calling where somehow we just know that God is calling or directing us to a mission or a work or a task. It's always hard to explain to other people 
this thing that you feel, this calling, this drawing of your attention to a particular mission, a particular thing that you've just got to do. Why is it hard to explain to people? Well, because it's a transcendent experience, that's why. It just can't be nailed down, A, B, C, D. Or how about when we, we truly hear the word of God? You know, those who come forward, they're having a transcendent experience. The words of life have pierced their soul and they respond with repentance and baptism or confession of a need for prayer, whatever it is, but that coming forward and that expression of, of, of need, spiritual need, that is powered by a transcendent experience. Sometimes we hear or we understand the word in, 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 a, in a newer and deeper and more fulfilling way than ever before. This is transcendence. I mean, this experience has made me weep. In reading my Bible and seeing something I'd never seen before, an idea, uh, an admonition of the Lord, an encouragement of some kind reduced me to tears. I couldn't explain it, I can't, you know, I couldn't explain it why that happened, it just did. Sometimes we see a vision of God's will. Not, not a supernaturally created vision, you know, like a, a burning bush or the valley of dry bones, not that kind of vision, but a real vision where real things and situations and people, they all come together like a puzzle, creating an image so that you can actually see what God's word is pointing you to in a concrete way. That's transcendence. That's a legitimate experience of transcendence in the modern day. And then there is the transcendent joy we experience when we see God's word and God's will fulfilled in our own lives or in the lives of other people. Is there anything more joyful than to see God's will being accomplished? That's transcendence. But beyond all of these, Paul describes <clears throat> excuse me, the transcendent experience of realizing the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8 he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Note the words that he uses here. God's love is greater. Wait a minute, didn't we say that was what transcendence was? Going beyond? Paul says God's love goes beyond all of these things, beyond death and life and spiritual beings and worries or fears of any created thing. He's saying when you experience God's love, you're experiencing something that goes beyond. You're having a transcendent experience. When we are immersed in the full realization of God's love for us in Christ Jesus, we experience transcendence in its highest and in its purest form. Now, the main problem or obstacle to our experience of transcendence is fear, fear. We're afraid because we've been taught that our only true experience of God is intellectual, not emotional. In other words, we know God by knowing correct doctrines about God. That's our approach to knowing God. This is like saying, I know my wife by reading a report about her or listening to what her friends tell me about her. 
We can know God's will and purpose and character in this way, but we don't actually know Him in this way. I give you an example. How would you rather know your wife? By getting a correct biological and anatomical report from her doctor or knowing her with a kiss? Which way is better? Which way is more intimate? Which way will bring you beyond? Now there's a reason why we're afraid and it has a lot to do with our history. The history I'm speaking of is the history of emotion and feeling and transcendence in the church. The Catholic Church called it mystery the changing of the bread and wine into the actual body and blood at communion, it was a mystery, transubstantiation to be exact. Every Sunday there was a miracle accompanied by an otherworldly experience of candles and ritual and imagery. They created a mystique, an experience through their religious service and system, you know, the saints, the relics, the pilgrimages, the shrines. And all of this to recreate this transcendency that the Bible talks about. But they did it in such a way that they brought the church to a point where it didn't even resemble a church anymore. People say to me many times, how, 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 do, you, you know, how do you work and how do you share your faith with a, a person who's Catholic? What arguments do you use? I said, no, you don't use any arguments, just get them to read the Bible. I grew up immersed in Catholicism. And people say, well, how did, you, you know, how did you come out of that? Well, I didn't come out, nobody talked me out of it. One day I bought a Bible when I was like 29 years old, never read the Bible in my life. And I started reading the Bible, that was it. <laughs> that was it. It was like, wait a minute, my life is nothing like this. My religious experience doesn't resemble this in any way. Actually, the first emotion that I had after reading the Bible was anger. I was mad. How come somebody didn't tell me about this here? Continuing our little history lesson, the Protestant Reformation was largely a reaction to these practices which were, for the most part, unbiblical. And so Protestantism promoted an intellectual experience, a reasoned approach to religion to counterbalance the Catholic excesses. Many Protestant groups took over Catholic church, church buildings in Europe and removed the statues. Imagine they painted over the frescoes on the ceilings. They replaced the stained glass in order to wipe away any suggestion of mystery. The goal was a purified and almost sterile environment. We, in the restoration movement, we come from this background. Now the problem for Protestants who broke away from Roman Catholicism based on the idea that only the Bible will guide us, not mystery, not history, not ceremony, not the papacy, their problem was this, who's right when it comes to what the Bible says? Because there were different opinions on many matters. And so we, in the churches of Christ, the restoration, not not reformation, in the restoration, we're the ones who answered that question by saying, correct doctrine through correct interpretation will lead you to the truth. And the result was a movement that focused on being correct, but rather lifeless. So the Catholics focused on the effect, the mystery, and they neglected the actual cause, the Bible and they ended up with a religion that didn't even resemble Christianity anymore. We in the churches of Christ, we focused on the cause, the Bible, and were afraid of the effect, transcendence, because we feared making a mistake. And now, what do we have? We have rather lifeless churches, don't we? I mean, I've been preaching for, I've been preaching 
uh, for uh, 30, uh, I don't know, seven years, something like that, 38 years. 38 years. Do you, you know how many sermons you can preach in 38 years? Less than 100 amens. <laughs> Serious. It's a surprise when it happens. It's a surprise when it happens. Why, 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 why is that? Well, because if you say that, it sounds like you're being emotional. It sounds like you don't have control of yourself. And then comes the Pentecostal movement in the early 20th century. They put the feeling back into Christianity. Every service has a mystery because the Holy Spirit is at work every Sunday and Wednesday and Friday giving people this transcendent experience, tongue speaking, prophecy, healing, lots of amens. They also avoid the Roman Catholic error of neglecting the Bible by basing their claims and their authority for the experience that they have you know, on the Bible. The results, the fastest growing churches in the world. Why? Transcendence on demand. Transcendence on demand. The problem? They use their own definition of what transcendence is, not the Bible's definition. Just as they use their own definition of tongue speaking and healing and prophecy and not what the Bible describes as legitimate examples of these phenomena, a religious example of the end justifying the means. In their case, a counterfeit end pursued by an inaccurate means. And so in the end, they are very much like our Roman Catholic friends. They focus on the results and they pursue this with whatever methods work, using their growth as justification. We must be right in what we're doing. After all, we're growing, aren't we? I don't know where in the Bible that theory lies. We must be right, we're growing as a result, aren't we? The sad thing about Pentecostalism is that their system and their approach denies them the very thing they seek, true transcendence. They have the right idea, just the wrong tactics. So someone might ask at this point, well, what makes us so smart? What makes us better than them? Well, the only thing I can answer to this is that at least we're asking the questions and we're seeking the answers and we're striving to find that perfect balance where we truly worship God in spirit and in truth. Approaching Him in humility and submission, that's biblical. Communicating with Him according to His will and His purpose and not our own, this is correct, this is biblical, this is in the spirit of God's word and having that transcendent experience that must come from an encounter with the living God according to His will, not our will. I believe that the place to return to in order to restore, uh, excuse me, uh, to restore in our efforts to biblical worship is not inventing new forms of worship or increase the repetition of the present forms. I believe that the first step is to focus on our personal and corporate submission to God's word, not just intellectualizing or debating it. Submission that brings us to transcendence requires a couple of things. I'll say it again. Submission to God, remember I said that's how you practice to get good at worship? Submission that brings us to transcendence requires certain things. Number one, it requires true obedience. Obedience to the things you know and are convinced of now. When I first became a Christian, I wasn't sure about which was the true church. Did the Spirit actually dwell in you? What was the meaning of the book of Revelation? When I first became a Christian, I didn't know these things. They were still not settled in my mind, however, I was absolutely convinced that I had to give up smoking. <laughs> that, that wasn't a very complicated doctrine. I was smoking a pack a day, you know? 
And I realized, you know what, I can't continue in this Christian thing unless I give this up. I don't know a lot about Christianity, but I know this much. You know, some people, they wait to obey God until they understand everything. But submission to obey what you know is an act of faith towards God about what you don't know yet. So even though I didn't know if the Spirit actually dwelt in me and I didn't quite understand the book of Revelation and you know, there were a lot of points I didn't understand yet, I did know that I needed to quit smoking. That I knew, that I was sure of. And so that's what I did. And so submission that brings us to transcendence requires true obedience. Number two, it requires true discipleship. Not just faithful attendance to services, although that's included. True discipleship enables others to have the transcendent experience of seeing God living and acting in you. In other words, you are the cause of someone else's transcendent experience. The purpose of discipleship is to bring others to Christ by allowing them a glimpse of Him in you. My most rewarding and dynamic experience in Christ is seeing someone give themselves over to God more fully, based in part on something that I may have said or done to serve them in the name of Jesus. If you draw closer to God because of my ministry to you, you are blessed, but so am I. And then finally, submission that leads to transcendence also requires a true living sacrifice. Like all good things, there's a cost. The submission that leads to transcendence requires that we be ready to sacrifice what is precious to us. Don't get me wrong, God rarely asks someone to sacrifice what He's already blessed them with. You know, God doesn't give you a family and then tells you, okay, you got to give it up now. He, he's, he doesn't work like that. He doesn't give you peace of mind and says, okay, now you got to give that up. No. What He asks for is for us to lay on the altar the things that are precious to us, but that do not come from Him. For example, our secret sins are precious to us, but they don't come from Him. The source of our pride, that comes from us, that doesn't come from Him. The dreams and goals of our making, those are things that we have that don't come from Him. The delights of this world, which in themselves may not be evil, but together they get in the way of offering ourselves up as a complete sacrifice to God. These are the things that mark those who are fully engaged in obedience to God's word. True obedience, true discipleship, true living sacrifice. They may not be as flashy as a charismatic or modern or hip worship service. They may not be as easy to define and explain as a you know, three part sermon with a PowerPoint. But in the end, they will enable us to worship God in the way that He seeks us to worship Him and will reward us with a more perfect knowledge and experience of our Lord, something that is called transcendence. I've given it a different name, but it's something we know and experience, isn't it? Don't we all want to know God? That's the reward. The reward for a faithful life is that He will allow you to know Him completely. And how long do you think that that will take? Yeah, <laughs> an eternity. That's how long that will take. Imagine an eternity of transcendence. That's the goal. That's the gift. That's what we're pursuing. So if you need to submit to the Lord, maybe the invitation, that's the classic moment of submission, isn't it? So if you need to submit to the Lord in some way and require the witness of the church, or the prayers of the elders, or the encouragement of your fellow saints, 
Well, as we know, we provide this particular time. We give it a song to give us a moment of reflection. And if we do have a need to come forward, then we do encourage you to do that now as Harold leads us in a, in a song of invitation.